Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jennifer Nyman. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntech Consultants and the facilitator of the webinar series on behalf of Startup and ESTCP. The webinar today is focusing on DOD-funded research efforts to identify reliable techniques for detailed survey of unexploded ordnance, or UXO, at underwater remediation sites. Dr. Brian Houston from the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory will discuss his work to use structural acoustic sonar technology to more easily and accurately detect buried UXO. He is going to pause today midway through his webinar to respond to questions from the audience, and then we will end the webinar today with a longer Q&A session. The next several slides provide some instructions on optimizing your webinar. If you haven't done so already, you can download Zoom at the link shown here and provide it to you in your registration confirmation email. If you can't download Zoom, you can also view the slides using an internet browser like Firefox, IE, or Edge and creating a free Zoom account. If your screen freezes or you're not able to view the slides, try, controlling, um, try using Control and F5 to perform a hard refresh. If you have audio difficulties and you're accessing your audio through your computer, you can click the arrow next to the Join Audio button and select Test Speaker and Microphone and follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. If you continue to have difficulties, you can just call into the conference line shown here. You can also submit a comment using the Zoom chat box, but please use that chat box only for comments related to technical difficulties. The Q&A option in Zoom should be reserved for questions for the speaker. If you continue to have any technical difficulties, you can download a PDF of the slides from the webinar webpage and then call into the conference line, which is shown here. We will also be live streaming the webinar on the CERTIF and ESTCP YouTube channel, at the link shown here. Today's broadcast is listen only, but please submit questions using the Q&A box on the Zoom screen. You don't have to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. And in fact, we do encourage you to submit questions in advance of that session. When you submit your question, would you please add your organizational name at the end of the question? And that way we can identify you. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. David Bradley, who is the CERTIP and ESTCP Program Manager for Munitions Response. Dr. Bradley's professional career includes U.S. Navy supported research, laboratory directorship at the NATO Undersea Research Center in Italy, and research and academic activities at Pennsylvania State University's Applied Research Laboratory. Dr. Bradley is a fellow of the Acoustical Society and has chaired society committees and served as president. Dave, please proceed. Thank you, Jennifer, and welcome everyone. The next few slides will provide a quick overview of SERDP or CERDIP and ESTCP. CERDIP is a strategic environmental research and development program established in 1991 by Congress as a partnership between the, the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, and the Environmental Protection Agency. CERDIP's mission is to identify and address high priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on DOD requirements. ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies, especially important in all ESTCP de demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory ex acceptance. The next slide, Jennifer. There are several environmental drivers for the type of work funded by SERDP and ESTCP with the underlying objective of sustaining the DOD ranges, facilities, and operations. Uh, next, uh, one key environmental driver is a reduction of current and future environmental liabilities. Uh, this involves addressing contamination from past practices, uh, UXO contamination, and developing management approaches for contaminants of emerging concern. Next slide. 
We have several main focus areas for research and demonstration at uh, SERDP and ESTCP as shown here. I'll pause for just a moment so you can read through the, the list. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. Next, uh, technology transfer is particularly important within the programs. Technology transfer efforts include the development of videos, training workshops, and guidance documents. Uh, this webinar series is a substantial component of our technology efforts. Upcoming, our webinar series highlights research and demonstration efforts from all of our program areas. Upcoming topics include removal of munition constituents from wastewater, developing and demonstrating PFAS, uh, passive samplers, and others. Uh, you can find additional information about upcoming webinars on the, this link. Uh, all past webinars are archived and can be accessed using this link. Uh, and the last slide, I believe, is uh, a save the date for the upcoming symposium, which will be held uh, 28 uh, November through December 1 in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, uh, back to Jennifer and Brian, uh, NRL has done an outstanding job on a challenging problem, and I'm looking forward to details. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dave. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Brian Houston is the superintendent of the acoustics division at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, D.C. In this capacity, he leads a 100-person research organization that conducts basic and applied research in acoustics for undersea applications. His research has involved the use of acoustic signature physics, particularly in connection with in-water ordnance, submarines, unmanned water vehicles, and sea mines. Brian is a fellow of the Acoustic Society of America and has authored over 100 peer-reviewed journal publications. He received his undergraduate and doctoral degrees in physics from the American University in Washington, DC. Brian, please proceed. Thanks, Jennifer. So um, I'll start this presentation by uh, providing a quick outline. The um, outline is as follows. Um, I'll introduce the structural acoustic sonar concept and an overview perspective will be presented. Um, the uh, problem statement relevant to the CERTIP STCP program along with its objective will be discussed briefly. Uh, the technology that we've developed to both the met methodology and the maturity will be reviewed. Um, I'll discuss some key results and uh, also speak to the benefits to DOD more broadly. I think throughout the talk, I'll uh, be interjecting uh, those ideas and then uh, move on to next steps. So for many people who uh, in acoustics or an e &M or radar, when they're introduced to scattering, typically the first concept that they're introduced to is um, the idea of target strength. And in acoustics, certainly in water, it's very relevant. Let's say, for example, if I have a sphere, um, I get a very uniform response from uh, spheres. Elastic spheres, for example, tend to have a lot of structure in, um, in frequency space. Target strength, a fairly simple concept, is expressed as 10 times the log of the ratio of the scattered intensity over the incident intensity. Expressed in decibels, it's typically well understood in a community what is, uh, what is big and what is small with respect to different types of objects. In the plot that's shown here in the upper right, the blue curve, uh, the frequency spans basically a kilohertz all the way up to 25 kilohertz. This is typically the frequency regime that we care about with regards to UXO studies in water. Um, if you'll notice the curve, um, it has a lot of diversity. It has peaks and nulls and so forth. And um, the nature of that structure tells us a lot about what actually is uh, uh, the sphere is made up of. 
And so it's that diversity and that structural acoustic signature we want to exploit in doing detection and classification of, of UXO. The next slide basically broadens the concept um, a little bit. Early on in our studies, uh, we coined the um, term uh, acoustic color, which basically speaks to the diversity of the response of structures in water like UXO. The uh, plot on the lower left, basically um, I've suppressed here frequency, it's on the vertical axis. The horizontal axis has um, aspect, the illumination aspect uh, for, from a, for an object that where we're measuring the uh, monostatic response. And um, by adding that other dimension now, that uh, uh, aspect dependence of the insonification, we see that um, target strength is not simply one number. It's also a strong function of frequency, as you can see, and typically it's a strong function of aspect. Um, so structural acoustic sonars exploit all of this diversity in obtaining high performance detection and classification and ultimately even identification. So on slide 23, I'm presenting to you uh, a very busy slide, I apologize, but it captures in the, in the right hand uh, side of the slide, it captures um, across a, a range of angles from zero to 360 degrees in the horizontal axis. Vertical axis is the frequency response up to about 120 kilohertz or so. The response of a, a five inch diameter a rocket, which is a typical UXO item that uh, we study. This is a fairly um, robust item, um, fairly thick metal container. It contains uh, rocket uh, propellant and so forth when it's used. And so it sustains fairly high internal pressures. At the lower end of the frequency band, let's say 25 kilohertz and below, uh, there's a lot of elastic activity. And if you look at this uh, plot, you can see um, elastic wave types, membrane waves, and other phenomenon that are generated in the device uh, due to illumination uh, by an acoustic wave. Typically, this is a plane wave at long range. At higher frequencies, above 25 kilohertz or so, the object typically becomes very rigid. And so the scattering response is not so much a function of the elastic behavior, but of the geometry of the shell. On the next slide, what I'm going to do is show you the phase response that goes along with this frequency response. We need both, amp both amplitude and phase in order to properly process the data and come up with good uh, classification metrics. Um, so uh, the uh, slide 24 is identical to 23, uh, with the exception that I have now allowed phase, which has been suppressed at this point, to be plotted. So the amplitude and the phase response um, allows me to reconstruct the, the, the reconstruct the time domain signature and is a very important quantity in um, in this uh, in this research. So in twenty five, uh, slide twenty five, I just introduced this. Um, Laboratory for Structural Acoustics, which NRL brought online in 1989. It employed compact range techniques um, and uh, what, what I call a Huygens-based approach where we could uh, basically measure things uh, at the very close range of an indoor laboratory uh, and be able to project those responses, those angular responses to any point from the measurement uh, range all the way out to the far field. Far field um, is a precise, fairly precise term that is used in scattering physics and um, it's uh, different than typically near field responses. I can measure the scattering in the near field of an object uh, and get a different answer uh, than I can in the far field. So knowing what your range is compared to the near field, far field transition is an important experimental parameter that we track. But with regards to ultimately the application where we're hunting for UXO in the open ocean environment, um, that uh, typically those ranges where um, we're measuring are in the far field. And so it is the far field quantity that is the most important thing really to understand in the laboratory. 
Our laboratory was broadband. Uh, it is, uh, uh, it's a million gallons of water sitting in a, on a vibration isolated mount structure. Uh, it is low noise and fairly large, uh, fairly large laboratory, a picture of which is uh, shown uh, in the upper left on the next slide, slide number 26. So this laboratory for structural acoustics has a number of broadband robotically controlled sources and receivers to allow us to make the kinds of measurements that would allow us to do fairly um, intricate uh, research on UXO and other items of interest to the Navy. On the right, I show you a cluster um, of, of items in a photograph that captures UXO. We have a 155 millimeter shell and also mortars and the rocket and so forth. In addition to which there are items uh, that are also shown in this photograph that represent items that we deemed being sort of the appropriate pieces of clutter that one might need to separate ultimately in a useful system uh, in, the, uh, in the open ocean. Cinder blocks, rocks, and, and, and items of that nature. And the insert on the bottom basically shows you um, in a cartoon sense what the laboratory key elements look like. I can support a UXO in the mid-depth of the tank. I can alight it precisely. It can rotate um, and I can um, measure the scattered response as a function of aspect <clears throat> using shaded line arrays, planar arrays and such for sources and vertical line arrays typically are used for receiving the scattered data. Monostatic data is data that is collected on the object where the source and receiver angle um, are collinear, and I'm just moving the target. Bistatic uh, situations occur when I have um, a receiver angle that is different than the source angle. In this case, the laboratory can support measurements that are uh, that include full incident removal forward scattering. So in slide 27, I'm showing you examples of uh, UXO that are very common an 80 millimeter mortar uh, on the left, uh, the upper right, the five inch rocket again, the lower left, the 155 millimeter shell, and then the 120 mil millimeter uh, uh, mortar in the, on the right. Now, in each one of these, the, what's expressed is the amplitude scattering cross section and target strength from zero to 360 degrees. So the item is fully rotated in plane to take that measurement. The vertical axis goes up to 140 kilohertz. So it's a broad range of frequency measurements that are captured here for each one of those items. Each one is measured identically, in addition to which uh, those measurements are typically measured in the near field. These are far field projections for each one of those items. This is the typical signature that you would see in the open ocean if you were hunting for UXO. So in slide 28, um, I wanna just briefly discuss um, a, a fairly simple concept which required some work on the part of uh, numerical modelers to become uh, fairly expert at modeling um, UXO. And uh, we were getting ultimately after a couple years of working with uh, finite element, infinite element tools, getting uh, quite good at mimicking the response of UXO. In addition to which, we found that um, when we started uh, using classifier uh, uh, mathematics applied to these databases that the UXO and the pieces of clutter that we had selected to study separated quite nicely. There are two plots here. Um, let me just focus on the uh, image on the right, which basically we're, what we're doing here is we're taking a structural acoustics feature called correlation, and then um, another core, uh, structural acoustics uh, feature called localized symmetry, and plotting up the response uh, in a probability density sense of those items. Uh, and what you see is that the UXO separate quite well in this feature space against, if you will, um, the items like uh, cinder blocks and, and rocks that are sort of the size of a UXO and so on and so forth. We're able to observe this trend, both numerical databases as well as the physical databases taken in the library. And this is very good news because what it indicated to us is that um, in this feature space, um, UXO and 
false targets, rocks and so on and so forth, are quite a bit different, su sufficiently different so that I ought to be able to easily go through and separate them with a system that's working in the ocean. That was at least the hypothesis that was found to be true um, as we went through this program. So machine learning, um, successful classifiers of a generative nature, those methodologies were developed very early on um, using the experimental databases and the numerical databases that um, we uh, developed in the course of our research. So structural acoustics features for training relevance vector machines um, um, were what we centered our research on because of the high success rate that we were having uh, with those databases. The RVM, the relevance vector machine, is something that was originally developed um, by uh, Tipping, uh, Michael Tipping, who worked for Microsoft initially and generated some of the first publications in this area. A, um, a mathematician who was very skilled at automating the relevance vector machine and making it uh, productive in terms of computations, uh, the number of flops needed in order to, to generate uh, the kinds of training that we needed to do um, our research. So we typically used a relevance vector machine exclusively uh, for much of our classification and ID work. There were others, other Bayesian type classifiers at the time whose mathematics was out there um, and uh, we could have used, but it turns out the RVM was more efficient just in terms of computational uh, efficiency and for that reason, primarily, we stuck with it and use it uh, to this day. It is not a, convolu a convolutional neural network uh, centered approach, by the way, which is more modern. The RVM is something we use today because it works well, um, in addition to which it works well uh, where, we ha where one has sparse data. And typically in acoustic problems, scattering problems, even radiated noise problems, uh, uh, researchers and people who build applications and so forth are using sparse data. We almost never get into the big data regime uh, as some do who are doing uh, photographs uh, associated with the internet and so on and so forth. Small amounts of data. So on slide 30, I'm trying to capture the concept that we came up with in the, uh, uh, in the work that we did in the laboratory initially where we basically train a relevance vector machine to help separate uh, UXO from clutter. And we do this, of course, primarily using experimental uh, techniques. We found that to be the most cost efficient. Uh, numerical approaches to doing this, I'll say, uh, require uh, quite a bit of work, quite a bit of labor on the uh, part of a, of a modeler and uh, tended to require uh, much more funding and so on and so forth to build up the kinds of databases that one needed uh, to train in RVM. So typically we defaulted to experimental databases because of cost. Um, the types of clutter that's in the ocean or that are in the ocean also we found in some of our very early experiments using rail-based approaches and so forth also separated quite well from uh, UXO. So we persisted. So the basic engine that we've put together that we use today um, allows us to go through and fairly quickly train up a classifier because we can take data in the field if we want or in the laboratory. We only have a few UXO that we need to characterize. And so getting an RVM trained on uh, things like a UXO are fairly straightforward. Complexities, of course, occur when you move to buried objects. The sediment itself changes the signature, and so that requires quite a bit more work than just a simple free field uh, type uh, implementation. So in slide 31, um, basically shows you the competition. So at the time, um, it was high frequency side scan sonars that we were competing with. Uh, so the idea there is basically to get an image of a proud uh, object. In this case, this is a marine sonics um, uh, 1.8 megahertz sonar mounted on a Remus 100, and it's been used to generate uh, images uh, 
for proud UXO. In this case, the 155 millimeter uh, shell. This is a. These are images that were taken by Bob Lesko down at Panama City in 2012. But this approach doesn't work very well, of course, against buried objects. So it's one of the reasons why we pursued structural acoustics and started to work on the buried problem. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce um, uh, an ONR uh, sponsored workshop that took place in 1998 in Park City, Utah. Here, um, ONR was uh, sponsoring what they called the exploitation of structural acoustic uh, characteristics for mine identification. Or rather, this was the NRL presentation at that workshop. Um, the workshop was really uh, broadband sonar solutions for, um, for the littorals. In August 1998, we presented the idea of perhaps fusing structural acoustics um, with um, an emerging uh, technology, autonomous underwater vehicles. At that time, there was a lot of excitement. Uh, uh, AUVs weren't all that readily had. And the idea was to put those two together to hunt mines. And at the same time, we started working on UXO for a number of reasons uh, that include um, it was a serious problem and UXO um, were easier to get a hold of and to deal with experimentally than mines. The folks that sponsored this workshop um, and the attendees uh, basically viewed our uh, presentation with uh, um, a healthy skepticism, right? It was uh, often uh, uh, implied at the meeting that it's very difficult to measure low frequency broadband scattering in shallow water. Uh, this, is a, um, this was an idea, it was a, a feeling that a number of folks in the uh, traditional mine hunting community had being able to measure things in 20 feet of water at that uh, frequency is hard indeed. But one of the first things we did um, in the year after this workshop is we worked with Panama City Jose Fernandez and company to use his advanced sensors toad body to implement a low frequency projector that we had developed for it and the data collection approaches that proved that yes, indeed, we could go into fairly shallow waters and measure scattering cross sections uh, in the low frequency, flow frequency regime. Now, let me just mention that low frequency by definition, I'll say here, this is our definition, was really one kilohertz to 25 kilohertz. That is what's meant as uh, uh, by low frequency. And in fact, at the time we were using VLF, very low frequency as the definition of that frequency band. So um, the structural acoustic sonar, um, I've implemented the slide. Let's see, I'm now on uh, slide. Um, I don't see the slide number captured here, but at any rate, the title of the slide is structural acoustic sonar. Let me just point out is that the, um, the um, concept of a structural acoustic sonar has been applied to other problems that have, are of interest to the Navy. So this is slide 33 is what I'm on now. Um, unexploded ordnance was, is very important and it was a, uh, an area that was explored early on uh, by applying this approach. Uh, mine counter countermeasures as well, anti-submarine warfare, and counter UUV. So today, uh, this approach has been expanded to a, no a number of Navy hard problems. And in some cases, we used existing sonars in the fleet to exploit structural acoustic characteristics to do uh, detection and classification. I think at this point, I'll stop, and this will be our first stop to... Um, maybe uh, answer a few questions. So if the audience would like to answer, uh, ask some questions, I think we can take a few minutes and do that right now. Yes, thank you very much, Brian. Um, and just a reminder to our audience, um, please um, type in your questions in the Zoom platform using the Q&A box. Um, the first question we have from the audience, Brian, is, <clears throat> is structural acoustics only applicable via a near bed AUV system or are low frequency hole mounted systems capable of the resolvability that you're working with? So if I understand the question, we've been working um, 
and I'll talk a little bit about this um, as we move forward. We've been working quite um, hard to develop acoustic sources um, to go on AUVs uh, to generate those low frequencies. And we've had some success. It's one of the hardest problems uh, to do, as a matter of fact, because um, low frequencies typically require, and I'll say typically require, a lot of mass behind them and size and so forth in order to get down to, say, um, a kilohertz. Um, the uh, What we did is we developed um, um, a symbol based projector initially, which was very lightweight. Um, that was uh, something that was consistent with application on AUVs. And our major task in moving forward is being able to keep low frequencies and move the size of the vehicle down to um, smaller and smaller sizes, say, for example, a factor of two or three. Okay, great, thank you. Next, how do you perform classification if you have only one pass by an object and not a full 360 degree view like you have in the lab? Um, um, the, the commenter says, presumably you will not be able to compute the symmetry feature in that case. Well, in fact, uh, you can, and the details of that need to be sort of handled uh, offline, I think, but we've been able to reduce the number of angles uh, that are required in a single pass and quantify or parameterize this and understand what the reduction in performance is. And okay. of course, symmetry is not the only structural acoustics feature that one uses. Okay, thank you. How do you handle multiple objects in the view of the sonar simultaneously? It's, it's a very good question. Uh, the resolution, um, let's say in a proud case, forget about, let's not talk about buried objects at this point, but if um, I have a condition where I have proud objects, we use in our techniques uh, synthetic aperture processing which is similar to what is done in both radar as well as in acoustics. Uh, synthetic aperture imaging sonars um, are fairly common these days. The idea is to build up a synthetic aperture and reduce the, uh, improve the resolution, the, the spot size of the receiver, um, and uh, perhaps seek to make as an objective function um, having the patch size, if you will, or the spot size, about the size of the object you're looking for. When you get down to that level, you can also uh, improve it a little more and get fairly good separability, at, even at these low frequencies of uh, the location of multiple objects. So separating object from object is something that is, uh, is a, it's an approach that we had to develop in the process of developing um, the structural acoustic sonar. Okay, great. What are the potential interferences to the success of this method while the device is scanning? Well, um, I'd say one of the, the most uh, confusing aspects of all this is multipath. One of the, I think one of the, the uh, pieces of physics that is difficult to deal with is um, when I'm in shallow water, I'll get the um, different ray paths coming in. And oftentimes in the recovery of the signature, there's you're you get confused about what is the first uh, the first eigenray, if you will, uh, compared to others uh, with bottom bounces in them and so on and so forth. So developing the techniques to allow you to separate that out, uh, that physics out of the reception is um, one of the big challenges. Okay, great. Um, next, you had mentioned um, neural networks. Um, looking forward, is it possible to combine the broadband multi-aspect structural acoustic sonar with a convolutional deep learning neural network with that increased performance? So this is a question that we're asking today. Um, so far, we've been using the sparse techniques that are offered up by the RVM and so forth. and um, we're, uh, we anticipate as we increase the size of the uh, training data that we ought to be able to increase the performance. And it's sort of a general question, almost an academic question that we're asking. Uh, there could be some, um, some uh, performance improvement there. But what I will say is that in 
uh, in our work today, we haven't found uh, neural networks to be providing um, any performance enhancement. And so for us, it's a, it's a research challenge. Okay, interesting. Um, and we'll have uh, one final question for you now, and then we'll come back to more questions for you um, later. Um, have you um, assessed the effect of the object size or shape complexity or other factors versus the level of performance? Are there certain, certain aspects that, um, that relate to the level of performance? So um, I think the answer is yes. One of the things I will say is that um, items that um, don't have any symmetry at all and uh, there's some other coherent features and so forth that if they're absent, it looks much, much more like a uh, false alarm piece of it looks like ultimately uh, something that um, has a confused shape, for example, like a rock and so on and so forth. So at some point you run up against uh, the limitations of the technology because we are at some point going to be using the coherent behavior of the UXO uh, to actually determine that it is a UXO. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. And at this time, we'll move on to the second half of your presentation and we'll come back and, and ask additional questions after that. All right. So let me move on and uh, talk about the problem statement, certainly from the perspective of CERTA PSTCP. So UXO hazards are there, we know about them. Many military installations have adjacent water environments that contain UXO due to dumping, accidents, wartime activities, and so forth. CERTIF's interest, their goals uh, are consistent with that. They wanna develop and demonstrate technologies that are able to detect and classify both proud and buried UXO during remediation activities with high, high PDPC, probability of detection, probably times the probability of uh, a classification together with low uh, PFA or false alarms. So next, the current approaches um, that we find is, we, we, we find competing with um, are high resolution imaging sonars and sonars that are even use synthetic aperture um, to really improve the resolution of the images. Also magnetic induction sensors uh, both of which don't penetrate the sediment sufficiently for most buried UXO. So the big problem here, as we see, is the buried problem. Not a surprise. So we've recently demonstrated a structural acoustics approach in using an AUV um, to deal with both proud and buried UXO and blind test in the approaches to Boston Harbor. Uh, these sonars were integrated onto large and not inexpensive uh, bluefin AUVs. Uh, the reason why I bring this up is that um, these are very capable UAV, uh, um, AUVs, um, a lot of energy, they have uh, a lot of legs, if you will, in that sense, it's for extended missions. Um, they also are big enough to support uh, low frequency projectors, projectors that actually go below a kilohertz have been developed for those systems. Um, it's hard. And transferring this structural acoustics technology into small, let's say, man portable AUVs would provide, we think, a practical alternative to what we're doing now. That is reduce the cost. But if one wants to find uh, UXO, there is a certain price associated with it. Our techniques uh, work. And um, what we'd like to do is keep the same performance but drive down the overall cost in terms of the size and the complexity of the uh, truck that the um, sonar is operating on. So the next slide basically um, uh, outlines the project objectives. We wanna demonstrate AUV-based structural acoustic sonars that are able to detect proud and buried UXO in shallow water regions, which can act as surrogates for location uh, in which the DOD holds environmental responsibility. So it's not enough to go in to a benign area um, and uh, that has no complexity and so on and so forth uh, in order to demonstrate techniques. We have to demonstrate technology that can work in more complicated environments. And that needs to be defined um, by both participants as well as 
uh, sort of in the STCP. Ultimately, we also want to be able to assess the performance and the cost of technology and to inform people who need to do this for a living what it's going to take to, uh, to clear the, um, uh, the environment. Our performance goals right now are, uh, we've set uh, a PDPC product at um, a 0.9, uh, probability of false alarm at about 0.25, and a lateral location accuracy of about uh, 0.5 meters or less. Coverage rates on the order of um, 10 acres per hour. Again, this is for buried UXO. For proud UXO, the numbers are very similar in terms of probability of detection and classification, uh, as well as false alarm rates and the lateral localization accuracy. But the coverage rate, because the uh, proud UXO problem is somewhat simpler, uh, should go up for about, a, about an order of magnitude. So we think we ought to be able to get high performance. We actually have uh, demonstrated reasonably high performance for proud UXO. That is about a factor of 10 higher than it is for, for buried UXO. And I think it makes complete sense as you go into the sediment, um, the uh, overall uh, uh, technology is more difficult and a little bit slower for reasons I'll talk about um, in a moment. So our technology, our methodology description uses a structural acoustic sonar, which I've described briefly, uh, but I'm also, um, I'm also going to develop two, or we have developed two different sonars that go on the same vehicle. So our approach is to use a, a truck, if you will, the back end of an AUV that contains the propulsor, the energy, uh, data acquisition, navigation equipment, and so on and so forth, plus the sonars like DVL and, and, and so forth that are aiding sensors for the, um, uh, for the IMS, INS, I'm sorry, the inertial navigation system. And I'm going to take one, one sonar and I'm going to put it on it and I'm going to hunt buried UXO. I'll take that off and I'll add a different sonar on the same truck, the same vehicle, if you will, to hunt the uh, proud cases. So two different sonars, one vehicle. Uh, and um, this next slide basically uh, captures, I have here a few images that capture the essence of the downlook sonar, which is predominantly used to uh, uh, detect and classify buried objects, buried UXO. Um, it uses a pair of wings uh, that contain the receivers. These wings are, uh, have a robotic stage and they out, they uh, fold out and fold back in um, before and after launch so that we can operate the system in a high C state. We don't have wings that are dangling out there that can get damaged in a launch and recovery exercise. In the upper right, I just capture a few images that show some of the development milestones for the uh, projector for the downlook system. Um, so in the cylinder, which is in the third cluster down, um, and I'll try to just overlay the pointer here to let you know what I'm talking about. This is a, a side look image of the down look sonar. That aluminum looking piece there is the receiver array. We have one on both sides. The projector is mounted on the bottom and it um, points downward. It's a, uh, geometrically, it's a diverging source. It's fairly strongly diverging and um, um, that's, those are the sort of the key elements of the downlook sonar. So that's um, one sonar that we use on our um, AUV truck. Uh, the side look sonar is captured in this lower part here where you have um, a source which is on the 90 degree point. It's looking directly outward, horizontally to the bottom and so forth. Um, this uses um, uh, a, a very specific type of projector technology called symbol-based projectors, which allows this source to reach down to very low frequencies and generate a broad band of, uh, of energy that goes out. And uh, they're a single crystal in nature. Each one of these uh, symbols are single crystal in nature. And it has a volumetric nature to an air bladder in the source itself that allows it to resonate at very low frequencies and makes it particularly useful um, uh, on an AUV. The receiver arrays that were developed um, um, were developed uh, in stages and 
Uh, basically, it's 128 elements, uh, point receiver, if you will, in a rectangular format. All of that data is collected simultaneously. So um, moving on to the next slide, which is, I believe, slide 41, you see um, uh, the image on the left just sort of captures for you um, the process of launching the AUV. At this point, that, that launch point, um, it doesn't matter which sonar is on there. It uses identically the same hardware and processing uh, and procedures to get um, the side look sonar in the water on the uh, AUV truck, the 21 inch diameter AUV truck. Um, and if I swap that out for the down looking sonar, I'll use that same apparatus and set of procedures. In high sea states, such as sea state five, which about as, it's about as high as we've gone, um, uh, that's, a, that's a fairly dynamic, dangerous state to be in, sea state to be in, and to be able to detect and classify to launch and recover AUVs to work in that kind of environment is, um, um, is very challenging, but we've developed the techniques to do that. So these images on the right basically just try to capture what we mean by side look once again. Um, so side look basically shows you the projector pushing out and then getting reflected energy back into the synthetic uh, array. It's a, feel, it's a real physical array, of course, that synthetic aperture techniques are applied to. And then for the down look sonar, we do something very similar. Here, the synthetic aperture is working in the long track direction, but it's not side look anymore. It's getting scattered energy from the bottom. And then we're going into the, uh, uh, into, uh, the sediment itself many, many meters. So the bottom image there sort of uh, expresses that to you. Now the down look sonar can be used in a little bit of an abstract way. We can go in and run um, what you might call uh, mow the grass patterns, but we can also add uh, and typically do add these um, uh, diagonals to increase the overall uh, size of the database and to give us more performance against particularly hard uh, buried UXO problems. So synthetic aperture uh, sonar is something that's been around for a while. It's also been used as uh, in um, radar, as I've mentioned, and other electromagnetic problems. Um, the image on the top basically shows you the response from a UXO that is um, a proud and you can see that it's quite noisy, right? Um, and that's because there is a uh, reverberation uh, in the patch that's associated with a fixed real aperture length, which gets bigger uh, with range. So we defeat that with synthetic aperture techniques by going in and building up a, an aperture now that's bigger, multiple pings, bigger, and therefore the along track dimension shrinks and we end up with uh, reverberation terms in the noise part of this problem that are low. And so that along track uh, dimension, that delta goes like one over the length of the synthetic aperture. This is a well-known technique. Uh, in order to apply it ac acoustically, you have to be, um, you have to know what you're doing and have very tight control over the navigation, the micro navigation, as well as the timing. This technique can also be applied to the downlooking sonar I'm not going to talk about that anymore, but that's done uh, for the volumetric sonar um, for the buried problem. I'd also like to point out that there is technology um, uh, and methodology associated with using the um, sonar that looks out and uh, looks to um, detect and classify um, the uh, proud uh, objects, and that's done at low lower gracing angle. Um, the look down sonar um, gets above the critical angle, the Snell's law critical angle, let's say for, for a sandy environment, um, that'll be uh, something that's close to 22 degrees or so. Um, even at low frequency, um, um, the, um, at low frequency, I don't have a lot of penetration in, in grazing angle incidents. Getting above that critical angle now with a sonar that lets me uh, get deep penetration at all frequencies um, is um, the way we look for buried UXO. And this works quite well. Uh, it, um, I'll point out that uh, the long track direction is where I get synthetic aperture gain. 
the real aperture is in that horizontal direction where you see the receivers. And I build a um, strip map, if you will, um, by um, squinting um, out to the cutoff angle of both the port and, and uh, starboard direction so that I can almost get as big a uh, strip um, uh, running the uh, look down sonar as I can um, with a side look system. Not quite, but almost as much because I'm going all the way to cut off um, in the um, look down system. Squinting is what I should be saying. The next slide basically just captures some images of what it looks like to launch and recover the look down uh, sonar. The wings are on a single stage um, robot uh, where the wings deploy. Once the vehicle is in the water, the entire system is in the water. High sea states um, uh, can be handled quite readily with this approach. And the, the vehicle sonar system is no more sensitive or fragile to a high C state with the wings than it is in the uh, more conventional side look sonar. The technology methodology description has to also include a discussion of the processing. The processing is both automated as well as there, um, we have the ability of, to insert a um, human operator. Human operators are valuable for a whole bunch of reasons. One of the things that we did is to test the human operator, how well it worked against um, the um, automated RVM uh, based classifiers. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but, to, but this is one of the things we did in our research. So the automated processing takes raw data, gets the um, data ready to be tested against a trained RVM, and we have false calls versus positive calls, both at the classification level and ultimately at the identification level with multiple passes over the same target. So in slide 46, I want to introduce quickly an idea that we implemented initially, which was to use fiducials. That is, we have structural acoustics devices that we put on the bottom when we start a survey. And these are, um, as shown in slide 47, these are called Lincoln hats because of um, what their geometry is. These are steel cylinders about 30 centimeters uh, long and about uh, 10 centimeters in radius, uh, along with a, a flat bottom um, steel disc. Uh, these go on the bottom, they stay there. And we use them as fiducials to be able to take multiple scans, right, pieces of cloth, if you will, and stitch them together very precisely in a sub uh, wavelength way. So accuracy. Um, for multiple scans, having the relative information between all of the different uh, measurement fields stitched together very precisely is an important uh, piece of, of doing this problem. And we use the Lincoln hats to do that. I'd also say right now is that we're in the process of phasing that out. One of, a, one of the things that our research has shown us is that using this approach is very powerful, but we found that in most environments, there's enough information in the sediments themselves, unique characteristics that allow us to do away uh, with the Lincoln hat uh, formalism. So the automating um, AI, uh, and in this case, these are machine learning based tools. We take data, we convert it um, into the right, uh, we package it properly. And for each item that we're exploring, if it's a UXO or false target, we develop the, um, uh, the uh, broadband feature uh, uh, database. And uh, ultimately we can compare uh, in a trained RVM, compare that new piece of data to, um, uh, to what I've trained up in terms of UXOs. Um, I can do this fairly in automated sense, the RVM is based largely the so-called, it's Bayesian. Um, it's not a convolutional neural network and so on and so forth. It is something that's based on um, some of the early work, as I mentioned, uh, Michael Tipping, uh, some of his published work. And one of the nice things about this is that it re readily provides you rock curves that give us a good indication of performance. Uh, there's an example shown here, and I can examine the performance with full 360 degree data, I can also look at this um, from the perspective of partial 40 degrees or 90 degrees of uh, drive-by data. 
So in our, in our work and doing the demonstrations, we use the approaches uh, to Boston as a place for us to explore the, uh, the kinds of places we'd like to um, test our structural acoustic sonar and our processing approaches. Um, this is an area that's been heavily modified uh, in the last ice age. A lot of this was created by the retreating glaciers of that time period. And so we're very, um, we're very confident that the, the environments that we studied here um, are very relevant. They're not simple, they're complicated. And we teamed up with a company called CR Environmental um, that helped us go through and carry out measurements to characterize these areas. Um, there are a number of boxes that we uh, found very um, interesting and we started to target them to characterize and begin to set up uh, the uh, approach to uh, burying UXO and false targets and so on and so forth to proof the technology. So 1A is here. Quincy is down here, by the way. So Boston proper is here. So we operated in the approaches to Boston. Still, I think that the language is used that this is this wide area outside of uh, uh, Boston is called Boston Harbor as well. We had a lot of real estate to choose from. And so um, we settled on 1A and then a couple other boxes. I'm only gonna talk about 1A today because of out of interest of time. And uh, point is, is that we used um, help from a contractor who is um, very skilled at doing this and analyzing data. Um, we used a marine sonic um, a multi beam sonars, solstice side scan sonar uh, mounted on a bluefin 12 uh, and uh, um, did a number of other things to help us characterize that area. So in this slide here, what I'm showing you is the blind test area and the training area um, that we used to, the, to train the RVM. So we did that in two different locations. We also did proud and um, we did uh, buried uh, uh, testing. We also used uh, sub-bottom profiling, conventional sub-bottom profilers, the edge tech, um, uh, towfish, this uh, 216S is something that we used. Uh, and then um, this is typical data that it's extracted with that kind of information. This was data taken in box 1A. Um, I'll also point out that we used uh, penetrometers as well. So in um, setting up the, um, the fields for training and testing, we had all that environmental data. Um, the insert here on the right shows you the laydown um, um, for training and testing. Here we have solidical objects, UXO, that are put in at different angles. We didn't just um, uh, bury them simply. We had a number of each one of the devices and uh, buried them with some degree of complexity. The rocket, the 155 millimeter howitzer, um, the mortars, as well as the two different size mortars. Um, False targets were cinder blocks, as I've mentioned, tires, um, a, a one gallon paint can and so on and so forth, and um, a scuba tank. So our testing predominantly involved these ki this kind of setup and uh, targets that were UXO of this nature, as well as uh, uh, false targets. So, um, in establishing the buried target training field, one of the things that we discovered was that the divers encountered more complex sediment than originally expected. And this is consistent with the penetrometer data that we took. Uh, even in these uh, environments that were supposed to be mud, there's some a few inches of mud on the, on, on the surface. What we found is that getting through, once you got through you know, the two or three inches of that soft sediment, there was very hard, um, uh, difficult, complex environment. And it was sometimes necessary to dig through a somewhat compact bottom and clam layers in order to get things properly buried. So we set these fields up. We um, used um, uh, above for the buried problem, we used above the interface reflectors, these stainless steel tubes. We placed those, uh, the divers did exactly where the, um, the, the uh, uh, buried objects were and we used a side scan sonar that could see these reflectors in order to localize for um, purposes of being able to do uh, the post-mission analysis and so forth. We had good location quality 
um, of the um, all of the objects using approaches like this. Um, so as I mentioned, significant sediment variations, high clutter densities. It's very important to, to point out that the man-made objects were the easy things to discriminate. The naturally occurring clutter, and there was significant amounts of it as we went deeper, naturally occurring clutter um, at very high densities made these environments difficult. And um, um, significant organisms, if you will, that were also in the, um, in the problem. Recreational fishing, fishing gear, um, quite a bit of that down there also complicated the, uh, the clutter problem. So um, one last thing I'll point out is the use of a penetrometer. Um, we had a sting penetrometer that was originally developed as part of TTCP. We have that, we have the expertise to, to use these devices. And these are just pictures of some of the penetrometers. They have accelerometer heads. These things are deposited over the side and when they hit the, um, the bottom, um, the deceleration allows us to quantify something called soil strength as a function of depth. And we can use this together with our models to predict the burial of a given uh, UXO item. And uh, this insert on the right just shows you the kind of uh, survey they, we, that we did in a number of the, of the boxes. Um, so um, for the surveys themselves, we basically used the same AUV as, I'm, as I've been discussing, two different sonars. We went out and ran against the buried fields using the look down sonar. We also uh, did the more longer range, slightly longer range uh, proud case, again, with the same AUV, slightly different sonar. And um, um, here in the blind test, you can see the lay down of, in this case, for the 2.5 uh, uh, acre buried minefield. We have the location of the uh, uh, the Lincoln hats shown here. We also show you the clutter as well as the UXO that was known only to the people that laid the field down. So we didn't know about this. This was blind to us. Together with the uh, proud field, again, all this information was held close by the divers, Gary um, Womack and company who work out of Panama City contractors held this. So um, ultimately we were able to um, go through and provide rock curves to the program. And uh, I'm gonna show you these here um, for the buried case. The um, vertical axis is PDPC of one, PFA of one on the horizontal axis. The green box here, this rectangle shows you our objective function. Um, that we bid to the program and the rock curve for um, a certain acceptable false alarms, uh, 0.25, we were able to hit the mark and do slightly better uh, for the uh, buried um, uh, UXO problem. Um, on the right, we show you the benchmark for the uh, uh, proud case. Here, we were able to get a, a PDPC on the order of 0.9, with a PFA of uh, 0.04. I'm sorry, the PDPC was closer to one almost for the proud case. So at any case, at any rate, in both of these cases, we did a fairly good job. We met our goals, and um, we're about we're excited about the results. Uh, moving forward, um, we're going to address some of the key results that we've identified. We have a successful structural acoustics methodology. The fusion, we believe, of structural acoustics, AUVs, and machine learning are enabling technologies for this problem. We were able to establish performance bounds in this set of experiments um, for this difficult environment. Uh, the environment that we saw in 1A and other areas, quite difficult, hard bottom, high clutter. The naturally occurring clutter was the problem in these experiments, not the man-made clutter that we put out there. Um, and we also believe, based on what we've done in this program, that we can reduce the overall cost um, through the use of man portable AUVs. So we want to move um, to the next stage where we're um, now looking at smaller AUVs, perhaps a Remus 300, to allow us to implement uh, something that is more one to two man portable. Um, um, in the new effort that has been uh, funded, we'll be going to 
uh, the West Coast in the fall to Squim Bay. This is a regulated um, CERTIP SDCP system, or if you will, test site, where we'll be able to go in there and run our existing system that we just showed you work on for Boston. We'll run it in this uh, facility and uh, basically be able to show uh, the type of performance in that facility, which is we're assuming based on all the type of work we've seen so far, all the documentation and the MCRL is located at an entrance to Squim Bay and it's quite simple. The environment is quite simple, a little bit more benign than what we've been working in in, in the uh, Boston Harbor. So we're moving to smaller vehicles. It probably won't be an Ivory 3 right now and talking to people, enough people who are interested in this problem. It will probably be something like a Remus 300. But we've been using a Bluefin 21, as you can see, significant difference um, and capability between these two. This carries a lot of energy and can go out for days and run. Um, and um, we'll be looking at something a little bit more this size single to two-man portable. So the next uh, slide basically starts to talk about some of the questions that I was interested in, in, in discussing, um, exploratory research questions, but I think I'll finish there and turn it back over um, to um, the appropriate personnel to guide us to the next step. Okay, wonderful, thank you. And um, just a reminder to our audience that if you would like to ask a question, you can type that into the Q&A box. Um, so we've had a few questions about um, how deep the sonar can successfully detect items that are buried in sediments. And then also, um, is there a water depth that is limiting? Well, let me take the second one first. First off, with regards to our requirements, we're really um, um, targeting the um, shallow water regime. And that basically begins at about 20 foot of water depth and goes out, I would say to 300. Those are the nominal numbers that uh, I think we've agreed to. 300 is pretty deep, that's very straightforward. Um, 100 feet is also very straightforward. The problems occur with this type of uh, sonar. You get into areas of uh, where you have issues operating when you get into the shallower 20 feet, 10 feet regimes. We've been able to operate up to 10 feet in, in, uh, in water depth, nothing shallower than that. Okay. Thank you. Does the technique's performance depend on bottom type? Absolutely. So with regards to very uh, objects in particular, soft sediments tend to be more attractive acoustically. Soft sediments tend to have, these are muds and silts, tend to have an impedance that's very close to, closer to water than the harder sediments like sand. Rock is impenetrable, of course. So um, the impedance of the, um, of the bottom is, is um, a big deal. And we prefer soft sediments uh, to harder sediments uh, what we've been able to demonstrate is penetration into um, um, soft sediments, uh, muds, silts that go very deep, um, uh, tens of meters even. Um, so um, the harder problem is sand, but we've also been able to demonstrate usable performance, um, uh, a handful of meters in a sandy bottom. So. Uh, the real hard problem would be able to do ultimately being able to do something that's um, uh, very high impedance. But of course, um, things like UXO don't bury in rock and hard sediments typically, but we can do sand, which is about the highest impedance material we've tested in. Okay, great. Thank you, Brian. Sure. Um, that, that relates to the next set of questions. Um, can you speak to how well this approach could work in different in different environments in different locations. So we've received questions about whether it could work in Hawaii, for example, where there's coral growth on the munitions, or or whether you've thought about testing it in the San Francisco Bay. Um, can you can you speak to different locations? That's you know that is a tremendous question because I think ultimately it's the uh, sort of the Achilles heel of all approaches that have to do with sediment. 
um, oftentimes environments change because the um, native uh, clutter density is high. So you can have surface uh, clutter, which is uh, very, very high. Uh, and so that's something you have to keep an eye on. But um, generally speaking, getting something trained um, with a relevance vector machine, say, for example, a Bayesian type approach, it has some limitations in terms of its performance uh, based on the fact that it is Bayesian. We expect, we anticipate that uh, convolutional neural networks, so-called deep learning approaches may um, allow us to go to even higher levels of performance. And this is a research area that we currently are not looking at very closely, but others in the CERTIP and ESGCP program are. And uh, we're very excited about learning a bit more about that area. Okay, excellent. Next, we have a question from the Netherlands. Um, with the downlooking system, do you have difficulty with the detection or classification of targets that are just below or are halfway into the sediment interface layer and that are right below the vehicle? Um, the question relates to whether the strong sediment backscatter at steep grazing angles could distort the response. So there really are two answers there. First off, um, the way these systems work is the immediate uh, backscatter due to normal incidence is not where we're looking for things. Uh, oftentimes what we're doing is we're looking um, just outside of that area. Right, so you don't get an immediate strong backscatter that you have to separate out the response uh, from targets. So we're looking slightly off that angle. Um, so that's the first thing. You've got to remember that's what you're doing. You're not directly normal and trying to discern um, signatures where you have this very, very strong backscatter piece. It's a bit of an art form, but when you automate it, it's very straightforward to do. Um, and so that's how we get around that issue. And with regards to targets being close to the interface, um, we typically are fairly careful about how, how we select where we're going to interrogate a target and get the multi-aspect information. Um, the, um, the nice thing about structural acoustics is that it tends to focus on the target when you're in a regime like that. Uh, the target separates quite well at the interface, particularly soft sediments where things bury. Um, I don't really have too much problem dealing with, say, mud and silts um, when the target is located close to the interface. Okay, thank you. Next, we have a few questions about the size and the scale of the equipment. I think that you talked some about the, the size of the UAVs, but can you talk about um, the scale of the sonar sensing equipment? Itself. UUV, UUV, you mean, yeah. So yes. we're working on that problem right now. And one of the things that we're doing is we're trading off um, frequency, particularly the low frequency end. It's broadband. The sonar itself it always has to be broadband because you want that um, spectrally diverse set of equip, um, features uh, to do classification. But what we're doing is we're now trading off the low end and we're bringing the low end up now to several kilohertz, and then we're moving to, in our studies, and then we're moving to uh, 10 kilohertz. The upper end is never a problem, really. It's not really a problem. It's the lower end. And so we're looking at performance right now in our studies um, as a function of the low end. And um, in the old, the system that we're using right now, we go uh, the projector and the receiver, the sonar electronics, it's all compatible with working all the way down to a kilohertz. So we're pushing that up to higher frequencies and looking at performance trade-offs. Okay, great. Next, um, we have some questions about the performance goal that you talked about of 130 acres per hour. Um, what is the nominal SWAT width of the mapping system? How far on each side of the sensor can you perform classification? And when you're talking about 130 acres an hour, is that 100% coverage of the seafloor? Um, so the answer to that question is yes, it's 100%, it's assuming 100% coverage and not partial coverage. And um, currently for the existing systems, 
um, we can reach out, oh, um, on a side for the proud uh, sonar, we can reach out on a side and do um, high performance detection and classification for swaths, uh, uh, for swaths which, which are about 100 meters. Um, and um, for the buried mine case, I'm sorry, the buried UXO case, we can, um, those swath widths now are about 50% um, to 60% of that. It's a function of the altitude. If I can get up higher, if I have deeper waters, I can look out to longer ranges. So for, for let's say 300 feet of, of water depth, I can look out um, 300 feet um, on a side. Uh, in order to do those searches. So there isn't a simple algebraic comparison between those two, unfortunately. But I prefer deeper water than shallow water to make the downlooks, uh, the downlook water have, or the downlook system, excuse me, have the higher coverage rates. Okay. And then with respect to the, the buried targets or the seeds, um, how deep were they and, and what were what was the range of their sizes? So the um, we've done um, we've done a number of different targets and target sizes for this study. Um, these are UXO, and uh, if you familiar with the size of UXO, they're typically rocket casings and uh, artillery shells and things like that that are assumedly unexploded. They also might be bombs, for example, that are dropped by aircraft. But typically, these items are a couple of feet long, and they're about five inches in uh, diameter. That's the general size. Now, when things get bigger, um, the performance changes. And in fact, it's easier to work against larger objects than small objects. One of the reasons why that is, is that we found that uh, certainly in this area that we've tested, the clutter is of the nature where um, it's about the size, the individual pieces of clutter are typically about the size of UXO. They're about a foot long, that sort of thing. That drives your clutter density up. But when you start to work with bigger things, um, things that are bigger than just a couple feet long, the clutter density in the volume drops pretty dramatically because there isn't a lot of, typically there isn't a lot of buried stuff down there in the environments we've been working on. Um, that is that size. It's usually smaller. Okay. I don't know, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Very good. Following, thank you. What features do the human operators rely on to make classifications and would there be a benefit um, to incorporating those features in the RVM? Well, um, oftentimes those features manifest themselves in a fashion so that they can be included in the RVM. One of the things I should say about human operators is particularly in high clutter environments, um, human operators get tired and they make mistakes. And this is one of the reasons why the Navy has moved to try to automate this for a number of years, because sailors, um, operators will sit there and look at data and um, the higher the number count in terms of uh, pieces of clutter that um, an operator has to, to sift through, um, um, the mistakes go up as that number goes higher. So humans get tired and their brain, you know, their brains get tired and they start to make mistakes and so the false alarm rate will correspondingly go up. It's a, it's a problem that has a lot of variability, but from our perspective, um, I would say there isn't anything that we've observed that human operators were picking up that wasn't also manifested in the RVM. Because the RVM is looking at a broad range of data. It's looking at the entire spatial spectral response. Okay. And then that relates to um, the next question, which we will use to wrap up with today, Brian. Um, when will the performance meet or surpass that of a human being? using a reacquisition system? Well, that's the big question. That's the question that we're asking ourselves. It's, it's sort of the, um, uh, the $60,000 question. Uh, when are we going to get to that point? We don't know. Research is required, and I suspect that CERTIP and ESTCP will continue to fund work in that area. 
we're certainly yes. asking those questions and then uh, we'll be addressing those questions in the next uh, project that we're just starting uh, this fall. Wonderful. All right. Well, Brian, at this time, uh, we'd like to thank you for the presentation and answering so many questions. Um, and next, we'll move on and preview our next webinar, um, which is on Thursday, June 29th, and it will feature DOD funded research efforts to increase um, um, energy efficiency at DOD installations. And please visit the Startup and ESTCP webinar webpage to register for the next webinar and any other webinars throughout the end of the year. And before we conclude, I would like to remind the audience that both the audio and a copy of the presentation from today will be archived on the Startup and ESTCP webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it if you could please take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at this time. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you. Thank you.